Hello and welcome back to the Beyond the Bar podcast, where we dive into the personal journeys of the legal mind shaping our world. I'm your host, Denise Satova, and today I'm very excited to welcome Robert Stefan Cohen, renowned matrimonial attorney. He's a co-founding partner of Cohen, Claire, Lenz, Greifer, and Simpson in Manhattan. And Robert, he wears so many hats. He's not only a published author, a sought after lecturer, but he is a trailblazer with a story that captivates and inspires. And his journey, marked by humble beginnings and military service, has led his esteemed status in the legal community, and I truly mean this. His story is a testament of resilience, intelligence, I would say unwavering commitment. Good afternoon. So Robert, we spoke just a little um, and I look forward to get to know you better uh, in this in this episode and also our audience. Can you share your journey about your truly humble beginnings to becoming legendary attorney? And what were some pivotal moments uh, that shaped this path? So um, yesterday I was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania Law School where I've taught for the last 20 years. Um, I've had uh, two sons who went to school there, which is the reason I, I taught there. I, I could have dinner with them. And um, at yesterday's lecture, I had Tracy Morgan come down with me. One lecture every term, I bring a celebrity client. And, um, and so Tracy, I asked Tracy, who was a former client of mine, I asked him to come down. And he was very funny, but um, he was asked a similar question to what you just asked me by me, which is talk about your humble beginnings. And I came to learn yesterday that I never knew that Tracy lived right across the street from the high school that I went to. He grew up and he, he grew up in the projects, and my high school was in the project. The, mo the most important moment in my life, now to come back to your question, the most important um, um, part of my life was I graduated from high school, my senior year, I was 15 years old, and my mother died in September of that year. And um, my sister was brought up by relatives, and I had to get through a year by myself, um, get through high school and figure out where I was gonna go to college. And what I knew was, I grew up on the border of Coney Island um, with, among other people, Tracy Morgan being my neighbor, which I never really knew. I'm older than Tracy, so I, we weren't actually neighbors. And there it became, what was I going to do my senior year? Where was I going to go to college? How was I going to support myself? How was I going to pay for college um, and room and board and so on? And so I made a plan for myself. And the plan for myself was to get out of New York to go to a, a liberal arts school. And to me, people that were different than I remember growing up where I grew up, everybody was like me. We were all poor. Um, I was particularly poor because we didn't have a working kitchen. Um, and so we had to worry about where, how we were gonna eat. But most people were like me. And I wanted to meet people other than myself. And I wanted to grow up being much different than the way I grew up. And so I think, in a lot of ways, my mother's very early death, she was 37 years old when she passed away. A very, my sister being brought up by relatives and my having to find my way on my own pretty much. We didn't have a college advisor at my high school and I would, would have been the first college uh, graduate in my family. And probably the first high school graduate actually. Um, um, in my, as I was in my senior year, I hadn't graduated high school. So I was facing these two big hurdles, uh, graduating from high school and graduating from college, all at the age of 15. And I think that was sort of um, uh, uh, the demarcation of my change in life. That is, a, that is an incredible story. To have that foresight at age 14, 15, um, having gone through such a tragic loss, Robert, that's... Uh, that's just astounding. So where did you go from there after you graduated college? So I had, I had a couple of burdens. First of all, I had to take the Regents examinations um, that New York State gave 
in order to graduate from high school. Um, I was saddled um, with the issue of uh, worrying about my father and my sister. Um, and I had, to, I had to make my way through my senior year. And that was a huge hurdle. I remember having dreams, recurring dreams that I failed the Regents exam. Um, I had to take a French Regents exam and some math Regents exam, which I don't remember. And I remember having these horrible dreams, Denisa, in which uh, I, I was, uh, I, I would wake up in a, in a sweat, thinking that I was not going to get through my senior year. Remember, I had accelerated through, um, through school, yeah. having been able to graduate when I was 15. But I was still, I, I was so scared and nervous about not getting through, and I got through. I had no idea where to go to college. I had no money. Um, I um, had no real help. And I decided I had to get away someplace rural and, uh, and someplace where there were going to be kids from different places other than the neighborhood that I grew up in. And I chose a small liberal arts school um, at the western edge of New York State um, and called Alfred University. Most of your um, um, listeners probably will not have even heard of it. It was a small liberal arts school, but I made friends. I, I made friends with kids who lived in houses and who had working kitchens. And oh, we didn't have to worry about the things I had to worry about. And I visited with them, and I stayed with some of them over the over a holiday. I was embarrassed about my own apartment, so nobody could visit me. Um, but I learned a whole other way of living that I had never known growing up, literally in the bowels of Brooklyn. And um, it was a big change in my life. And from somebody who was supposed to be a dentist, my high school yearbook as me as a dentist, it would have been a disaster. Me and my hands <laughs> don't work together. I could have never, never made it through. But as a kid then, and we're talking about in the uh, 1960s now, um, as a kid in Brooklyn, that's, that was a way of being a do doctor or a dentist. And so <laughs> that's what my family told me I should do, and that's what I thought I would do. Um, it took me and my, until my junior year of college to walk away from being a dentist, disappointing my family tremendously, because I was going to be hmm. sort of a way out for them. And I decided after a constitutional law course that I took at undergraduate school that I wanted to be a lawyer, and that was my way out. There's so much packed in there. Wow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to the very beginning of my introduction. Your middle name is unusual. We spoke about it earlier. Stefan, where does it come from? Well, since when I was born, I was too young to name myself. Um, it came from <laughs> my parents, I, 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 I guess. Um, and instead of giving me an S-T-E-P-H-E-N, which is the general way, of, they made it a P-H-A-N, which sort of uh, um, gave me a, a, a one, one step up from uh, from Coney Island and the, the border of Coney Island and Bensonhurst, where I grew up. So um, anyway, that's that's where that all came from. I had to prove it to my, actually, I had to prove it to my sister, because she thought my parents would have never named anybody <laughs> Stefan, and I had, my, I had my old birth certificate. Funnily enough, the birth certificate that I had um, was altered in one way. It was not altered with my name, but I had to work earlier than my age allowed me. So I was born in 1939, and instead of leaving the nine, I made the nine and eight, which was easy to do, so I could start working before I was 14 years of age. I still have that birth certificate, by the way. We won't tell anyone. Please. Mm, that's called. I've been a no, lawyer we, for too we, long a time. <laughs> oh. You also served in the military. I did. So. Um, Back in those days, we had conscription, um, and everybody had to go into the military at some point. Um, when I graduated from, um, from law school, um, before I graduated, I came to the realization that if I had to go into the military, um, I wanted to be an officer. So as soon as I graduated, 
from law school, um, I could apply to becoming a JAG officer in the U.S. Army Reserve, um, which I did and which I was accepted for. And so now, for the first time in my life, people actually respected me as a, as a, as a military officer. Um, mm. I, I love the military. I even gave a thought to it of, of staying in the military and making a career out of it. I ultimately didn't because uh, I got the job that I really wanted um, um, after, after my military assignment. But I loved it. And I, uh, I was stationed uh, in Washington. I was stationed in Fort Meade, Maryland. I was stationed at Fort Drum, which is all the way on the Canadian border. Um, I represented uh, um, um, soldiers that had done bad things. And so I got a chance to do litigation in, um, in the military. And ultimately, that's what I ended up doing. Um, and it's too bad. Um, I feel really badly that none of my kids um, went um, to a military academy, and I would have been very supportive. And I even talked to them about going into a military mm. academy. None of them wanted to. And none of the young people today uh, care much um, um, uh, about going into the military. And again, um, it was great for me. And I think it's important for our country and it's important. We've got two wars going on now um, in the Ukraine and, 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 and the, in Gaza. And, and, and frankly, we're thinking about military again for the first time. We have to think about it. Maybe this will be an impetus for more American young people to go into the military. Not because they have to, but because mm -hmm. they want to. Thank you for your service. Thank um, you. That's that's near and dear to my heart, as you know. My my son served; he was on a U.S. submarine. Um, now, switching gears a little bit, you wrote an interesting book coming from a matrimonial attorney called "Reconcilable Differences: Seven Keys to Remaining Together." I'm just curious, what uh, motivated you to write this book? So there's a there's a short history about the book, um, which is important to tell you. So. I had represented a woman um, by the name of Joni Evans, who was a very important um, a literary agent and, uh, and um, was in the book publishing business. And I did her divorce, which, was a, which I tried, um, went up to two appellate courts, and we were very successful. And so I decided I wanted to write a book. I couldn't write a book about the various celebrity people uh, that I had represented that you and all the podcast listeners would have heard of um, because I was an active practitioner and you can't mention people, people's names. And I didn't want to do that, so, but I did, I had some very interesting um, clients. I mean, I represented uh, at, at, from time to time, both of uh, the former President Trump's ex-wives um, and a whole other bunch of very important people. And so I decided to change everybody's names and, and, and write a book in which I wrote about the people I was representing, but not with real names and, and changing them uh, enough so that nobody would recognize them or they'd have to guess as to who they were. So instead of President Trump, um, um, I was writing about uh, somebody in the garment center business instead of in the real estate business and like that. And um, I, um, Joni Evans, who I just mentioned, was my book agent. And we sent it to the, the book business was different then than it was now in that it was, um, it was a big business. People bought hard covered books and they went to the beach and read them instead of putting plugs yeah. in their ears and, lis and <laughs> listening uh, to the books on tape. And um, yeah. I su we submitted to the seven, six or seven um, major publishers and everybody loved it, but they wanted real names. They, they, mm. they wanted to be thinking they were reading page six of the post and they got real names about people. And of course I couldn't do that. So I said to Joni, I've now spent, oh, I wrote 90 pages of the book. Um, and I said to Joni, what am I gonna do? And she said, well, let's think of another book that you could write. And so I had, mm. by that time I was a matrimonial lawyer. Uh, Early in my career, I was a commercial litigator, so I sort of morphed into being a, a, a divorce lawyer. And so she said, what kind of book would you write? 
like, and so I, I said, with 50% of the Americans getting divorced, and with that percentage being higher, particularly in Eastern Europe, um, um, where it was 60 or 70%, I said, let me give my hand at a, at a book about how to avoid people getting divorced. And she said to me, well, wouldn't it affect your business? And I said, not really. I said, there are going to be enough people who need good divorce lawyers um, who are going to come <laughs> to me. So I don't think it's going, to, it's going to affect me. But I think if I write a book that's good enough, I think maybe we could sell it. Because um, I began to develop a name in, in, in divorce law. And so I said, let me get my hand at it. And so that's how it came about. Um, we wrote another 75 or 85 pages. Um, um, we sent the book out to the same seven or eight publishers, and they liked it. Um, and I got, a, um, for our first book, I got a really big advance. Um, and of course, I had to make the commitment to publicize the book. So as a lawyer who's out there um, and who's speaking all the time or trying to speak all the time um, and who has learned that skill, um, I learned with the book I was going to have to go out and try to sell the book. You just can't write a book and, and, and expect right. anybody to buy it. And so we went on a book tour. I went on two tours between New York and California. And, um, and I did the South on another trip. And I loved it. It was, it was kind of really fun to, to, to do that. I did all of the major uh, um, TV stations and all the morning newspapers and um, and the Times did a profile of me on the book, um, which was I never could have gotten at that point in my life had I not written a book. So it was probably good for my career in, a, in, in an odd way because I was, I was espousing the idea of not getting divorced. On the other hand, yeah. it ended up being good for my career because people got to know me that didn't know me. <laughs> and, I enjoyed, I, and I enjoyed the book. And, and a funny aside to that is I'm in my office now. And you're looking at me and sitting in my office. We're moving the week after next. And I wow. have a hundred books um, that I had written that for, I don't remember how I ended up with them. My assistant said, why don't you give one to each member of your class? And that would get rid of the I have 80, 80 uh, Penn students at my class. So she said, oh, no, I said, I don't want to get rid of those. I want to leave those. Be my legacy to my kids and my grandchildren. And um, so now I got to I got to figure out a place to keep a hundred of those books that I wrote that never got sold. I still get statements from Amazon um, about the book. So <laughs> there are people out there that still get it and and are kind of enjoying it. So that's the story of my book, Denisa. I love that story. I really do. And you're so so transparent, so authentic about it. Um, speaking of that, um, switching gears a little bit, what would you do if you couldn't practice law? So, um, I have no hobby. All boys, they all live in different places as far as Hong Kong, um, as close as the Upper West Side. Um, I live in Manhattan. Um, they all have their own lives, and, and one is only one is a lawyer. Um, so um, I, 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 my golf is terrible. I belong to a golf club um, I, I'm in the town um, that my second house is up uh, in the Hudson Valley. And um, so the question is a good one because I have dabbled. I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but I love decorating. Okay. And it's different than my first goal as a dentist. Uh, I would have been terrible as a dentist, but I think I, I think I might have um, um, been good at it. And so I help with the houses that we live in. Um, I, I certainly haven't done them, but I've helped a little. Um, I've come up with the idea uh, in, in our city apartment. Um, and uh, I, I, I think maybe I would do that, um, although it's a little too late in my career to become an, an important uh, interior designer. Nevertheless, that might be something I would do. I am never going to become a professional golfer um, or good enough at any sport to do that. 
Hmm. Good enough. I think we had an interesting conversation earlier before we start. And, and I asked you, why do you do what you do? Um, you have you have an unbelievable drive. There's almost a curiosity um, because I mean, you travel extensively. You still teach at, at, at law school. You have for many years, right? 20. Wow. I'm at Penn for 20 years now. Yeah, that's uh, you have so many so many different varied interests. Um, what what makes you laugh? Don Rickles. Okay, now I remember. <laughs> I forgot. Okay, <laughs> that's funny. I'm laughing. You mentioned the name, and I'm laughing. <laughs> Why does he make you laugh? I think he's very funny, and I I think. A Borscht Belt comedy was sort of something I grew up in because when mm. I was in undergraduate school, I worked in the Catskill Mountains as a busboy and as a waiter. So um, I sort of grew up a bit with that kind of humor. And it still, it still makes me laugh. Um, I listened, I represented Chris Rock, I'm rep I represented uh, Tracy Morgan. I'm trying to think of some other comedians that I've represented, um, they make me laugh. Um, um, I've seen both of them in stand-up comedy, and they both make me laugh. But um, I kind of attach myself to that old Borscht Belt humor, which Don Rickles is so good at. I have no connection <laughs> with Don Rickles. I get no royalties from anything Don Rickles does. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, I still think he's very funny. Good disclaimer. Okay. <laughs> you know, we could chat forever. Um, there's just so much, so much to you. So on a final note, Robert, what advice would you give to incoming attorneys? So I'll give the same advice I give to my class every year. Uh, first of all, you need to be good at what you do. And you need to be ambitious at what you do. Um, if you have those two things, um, um, you can be a good lawyer. The magic to this is, in my judgment, the magic is to connect in, early in your career with somebody that can mentor you. Um, somebody mm. who um, you can attach yourself to, who you look at and say, I'd like to be him or her someday. And, um, and, and, and try to follow such a person. Now, it's hard to do. The lawyers that I teach at Penn all go to big law firms um, in big cities, um, and they meet lots of great lawyers um, fairly consistently, but to attach, attach themselves to somebody is not so easy. So um, that's, that's the advice I have. Love what you do, be good at it, and attach to you know, somebody who you can really learn from. Great advice. Robert, it's been an absolute pleasure to delve into the multifaceted life. And thank you so much for sharing your unique journey with us today. This went so fast. I didn't realize we've got a half hour into it already. Thank you for doing this. <laughs> I really enjoyed it, Denisa. And for again. viewers and listeners. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And for, for those who want to uh, get hold of Robert and find out more about you, please make sure that you click on the bio link below. And do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Beyond the Bar Podcast. Follow us on all of the social media. And until next time, stay curious and inspired.